welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church. We are a physical and digital congregation located in Beloit, Wisconsin. I'm Dennis Roser, the pastor here at SJ, and we're glad you're here. Whether you're a lifelong Christian or just starting to learn about Christianity, you're in the right place. We are eager to tell you that you have a Savior who is Christ Jesus the Lord. Today's program is given to the glory of God by the St. John's Women's Guild in honor of all of our members and in loving memory of all past members. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us, and in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading from the Holy Gospels is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for Mary and Joseph's purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be called holy to the Lord. And they came to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary according to the law, Simeon took him into his arms and praised God. He said, Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace, according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and the child's mother were amazed at the things that were spoken about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Listen carefully. This child is appointed for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. 
so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Anna, a prophetess, was there. She was a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow of 84 years. She did not leave the temple complex, since she was worshiping with fasting and prayers night and day. Standing nearby at that very hour, the, she gave thanks to the Lord. She kept speaking about the child to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had accomplished everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town, Nazareth. The child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Together we confess our faith with the whole Church of Christ through the Church's Confession, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, amen. Have you ever prayed to God about something and experienced God's answer as being no? I suspect that all of us have had this experience. Each of us knows what it's like to pray fervently for something and it doesn't happen. Many times throughout my ministry, as I pray for God's people, I've prayed for miracles. Sometimes miracles have come. Other times, tragedy has fallen. It's a part of learning to pray within God's will. In Luther's small catechism, which I cannot commend to you highly enough, I study it every single day, as Luther did, and he's the one who assembled the catechism. But as we look at the Lord's Prayer, Petition 3, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luther says, what does this mean? He says that the good and gracious will of God is done without our prayer. But we ask in this petition that it may be done among us. Learning to pray for God's will to be done is painful. It's painful because God's will does not always line up with our will. Because we're imperfect. Because our minds and thoughts, desires, are warped by sin. We're turned in on ourselves. And if I'm truly honest, so many of my prayers are, are self-serving. They are self-serving. I have treated prayer like the drive-up box at a McDonald's or Burger King where I shout in my request and expect to come around the other side and have my order the way that I've asked for it. But that's not how prayer works. And so I am humbled. I am reminded that I can see some pieces of the puzzle. But only that. I don't see the whole picture. Not by a long shot. And that there are things within that picture that I don't see, that if I did, my prayers would be different. And so what I need to do is to trust God, knowing that He alone is loving, faithful, and just. I am not. I am sinful. He alone knows what is right, good, and loving. And to trust Him during those moments that he knows better because he alone sees the whole picture. As difficult as it is for me to learn this, and it's a lesson that has to be retaught to me over and over again, I'm not a quick study in these matters. It's all the more difficult for me to teach it to others. Teaching this to people who have suffered great loss is an arduous task with tears as I try to help people understand that there's so much that they don't see, that I don't see, and that there is good in trusting God in these things, which is why when we have a tragedy in the congregation, all the stuff that I was going to be doing, it's gone. I asked the office administrator to simply cancel those things out, reschedule it, whatever. But I attach myself to that family. And for weeks afterwards, will attach myself to that family. Because they're at a crossroads. Like it or not, they're at a crossroads. Either they will grow closer to God through this experience or they'll spit in his face and never want anything to do with him again. The role of the pastor is to be present in those moments 
and to continue to point them to God, continue to place God's Word before them and praying, praying, praying that they find strength there and not the end of their relationship with God. You know people. You know people who were once faithful churchgoers and believed soundly in the Lord Jesus Christ who now in bitterness want nothing to do with Him and want nothing to do with the church. Can that be overcome? You bet. In my experience, it's very, very difficult. It takes a lot of time, a lot of patience, and the listening to a whole lot of anger and having the door slam in the preacher's face many times. But that's the way it is. For we don't see the whole picture. And so we pray, not as we ought, but as we are able. But not receiving what we ask for is so very difficult. Now sometimes, sometimes we think we've received the answer no when we haven't. There are perhaps Three responses that God may have to our prayers. Yes, no, and not yet. It's not very easy to distinguish the difference between no and not yet in so many cases. If it's not yet, it demands patience and waiting, and that is tough. In our gospel lesson this morning at the temple, in Luke chapter 2, we encounter two long-suffering servants of the Lord God. A man named Simeon, who church tradition holds that he was 113. It's not written in the text, but it's passed down to us. It's as credible as anything else. We get the picture here in the text, though, that he is very old. And so you got Simeon, who's 113. And you have a prophetess named Anna. Anna, we're not given her age either, but we are able to make some conjecture here. We are told that she lived with her husband seven years after their marriage. So she was married for seven years and then lived as a widow for 84 years, which gives us 91. She was not married as an infant. We can tell that. We know that. Normally in that society, they married between 13 and 15. And so she's 103, 104, 105. She's up there. Both of these individuals have been waiting a long, long time for what they are seeking. Simeon is waiting for Israel to receive the long-awaited Messiah. It's bad. It's bad in Israel in the time of Simeon and has been for generations For centuries, they have been an occupied province. And what that means, what that means is essentially they are a source of revenue to another empire. They are under another empire's thumb, and all the other empire does is suck money out of the place. It just drains money. You pay taxes. So any money that's coming in, think of a local economy, if all the money that comes in gets spent elsewhere the economy continues to sink. And that's what's been happening in Israel. So that the people are very, very poor. Don't believe me? Look at our text this morning. Look at our text this morning. Mary and Joseph need to go through the rite of purification. Forty days after a mother gives birth to a son, she needs to make an offering. The offering for purification, which is a year-old lamb. And a sin offering, which may be a turtle dove or a pigeon, one year old. But there in Leviticus 12, where that's outlined for us, it begins at verse 6. We read in verse 8 that there is an exception made for impoverished women. They may offer two turtle doves or two pigeons. What do we read here in Luke 2? That when they make their offerings, it's two turtle doves. 
Joseph and Mary are dirt poor. Everybody else is. And they're under Roman occupation. They live according to Rome's rules. Everybody is longing for the day when God will send the promised Messiah who will deliver them. And so we read there that Simeon has been waiting for the comfort of Israel. Waiting for the Messiah to come and change this. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit, who has told him previously that you will not die before you see the Lord Christ, is prompted by the Holy Spirit to go into the temple courts. And he goes and he sees Mary and Joseph with the child Jesus. And he scoops him up into his arms. Imagine this. Simeon knows he's holding God. Or at least he has an understanding not far off from this. And so when he says, Lord, now you let your servant go in peace, one wonders, is he looking upward or is he looking at the child? He could have done either. But he scoops up the child after blessing them. And he says those words we sing after the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And then he talks about what it's going to mean for this child. And it's not all going to be good. And it's going to bring much heartache for Mary. You and I, the reader, we see Mary at the foot of the cross. It's the purpose of the Messiah. You see, the prophets oftentimes said more than they knew as they delivered God's Word. They didn't understand its full implications. Look at Daniel. Daniel says, I don't really understand this. God says, seal it up. Seal it up. It's for a later time. It's not for you. And so he speaks to the Savior. And then the camera pans over to Anna. Anna perceives what's going on. She is a prophetess. She is a female prophet speaking God's word. And who does she speak to? As we read there in the text, those who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. The same thing. Israel has been waiting a long time. You see, the answer wasn't no. But in their suffering, I'm sure it felt like it. Two examples, models of devout faith, Simeon and Anna. A model to us that we do not move too quickly to the conclusion that God has said no. But to persevere in prayer. To see prayer not simply as a transaction. I ask, and God either does it or doesn't do it. But come to learn prayer as a relationship. As a relationship. As we continue to journey in dialogue with God. Praying that His will may be done. Here's the most amazing thing. Here's the most amazing thing. Anna and Simeon received the answer to their prayers. In their own day, the Messiah came and they beheld His glory. And yet, in God's providence, in the will of God, within the Master's grand plan for the universe, it was much more than anything of which they could have dreamed. They probably didn't live to see Jesus as He took up His earthly ministry at age 30. Although I can't verify that. But what they expected was someone who would lead them out of Roman occupation. Someone who would bring about a day in which there was a living wage in Israel. That people could offer to the Lord what was required. A year old lamb and not simply two birds. Because they are so poor. And what they got instead is a Christ who comes to deliver them, not from Roman occupation. That only lasts for a while, however long we live. 120 years max, as we often read in, in Genesis. That was going to be the limit, eventually. 
but for eternity. That this Messiah came not to save from a conquering nation or empire, but to save from the things that affect us for eternity. Sin, death, and the devil. They were hoping for some political and economic relief. And what they received was an eternal joy and paradise in heaven forever and ever that will have no ending. In our first lesson, 2 Samuel chapter 7, David wants to build a a big church, a place where God's name may may dwell, a big house of cedar. God comes along and says to David, it's not going to be you. And as we read in Chronicles later, it's because David was a man of war and had blood on his hands. Solomon would build that temple. But God says to him, you want to build me a house? No. But I'm going to make a house for you. And he's not speaking of a palace. He's speaking of a dynasty in which his son Solomon would come forth and sons after that until we get to Jesus who would sit upon his throne and would reign forever. There would be no end to his reign. And it would not be for political, social, or economic comfort in the here and now. But it would be for the salvation of the world that all sinners might be restored to God and live for him in ever. Live for him forever, I should say. You have this joy. Pray to God for everything that's near and dear to you. Pray to God for the things that weigh upon your heart. Pray to God for other things, other people. When the answer is no, I pray that God gives you grace to trust Him. And when the answer is not yet, again I pray that you receive strength to persevere. Continue to be connected to this God. That you may know that a time is coming which will overshadow this time and all of its worries, pressures, tragedies, and unfortunate events that will last forever, that will have no end, in which paradise is restored and the problems of this world, they shall be no more. May God in His grace enable you to look at your problems in this life within that perspective that they will not last forever. That you cannot be destroyed, but that what will be for eternity are God's good gifts given to you through Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us today, and may God's blessing be granted to you by His gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.